So here we have got Ron, the pre-digital photographer. The one near the window um, is uh, actually dates to the 1960s, and it shows two miners coming, walking under a bridge, yeah, coming yeah, into the yeah, light. Yeah. So could we go back to photography and mining in the 60s for a minute? Yeah, well, why, why you did that kind of thing? Black and white photography. Can I go back to where I, the first photograph I ever saw? Please. I think I was telling you yeah, about it. Please do. Um, when I was about seven or eight, I had a, a most amazing grandfather. He was into all sorts of things. And one day he came with this little box and he said, go out in the front, now at the front on the pavement, and the sun is out, hold it to the sun and count up to 20 or whatever it was. So here's Ron standing now, people are passing and I'm holding this damn thing. <laughs> then I run back in with it. And then he takes the, the frame apart and in it was a sheet of paper and he just held it like that and then magically an image appeared on the paper. It was called printout paper and obviously there was a negative in there which I didn't see you see so he put a negative in and put the paper on top. Why I mention that at the moment I'm experimenting with a gum bichromate method of printing uh, and it's a coincidence that's exactly the same thing as I'm doing now. I'm coating paper with a chemical putting a negative and I, up with a computer now I can make big negatives you've got to have the size negative you want the print to be put the paper behind put it in a frame and, and I was sitting in my lounge with the door open holding it to the sun <laughs> waiting for the sun to react then go back in stick it under a tap and where the sun has penetrated will wash away where the sun hasn't penetrated will remain so you, you end up with an image so it's taken me 70 years, from <laughs> over 70 years, and I'm still doing the same daft thing that my grandfather did. Yeah, but um, it really started, um, let me think. I think I really got really interested when I started doing the A-level work, um, and I realized the value of, of photography. Um, and then I went into it quite a lot. I studied it intensely. Uh, and the history, because they had to write essays on the history and so on. Uh, because at the same time, some of the students said to me, well, can't we do an exam in photography? I said, yes, you can do all levels and A levels. So we started doing those alongside the design course. So we had them doing design plus O level and A level photography. Um, and that's when I really, really took off. Yeah, because you taught at Caffili for about 30 years, from yeah, yeah. mid-50s to mid-80s. I got a year in London, in the yeah. first experimental comprehensive school. Right. <laughs> it was abs no, no one else in the country, it was the first one. That so what made it experimental? Because it was the first one. Right. <laughs> this it was the William Penn yeah. experimental yes. and in Peckham, in a very rough area of London. There, there, there were these two other areas I wanted to talk to you about. One was photography, one was education, and we're hovering now. So let's, yeah. let's do the education bit then. Right. So you're in London, in the early 50s, at the William Penn. William Penn Experimental Comprehensive. Comprehensive. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's another thing to perhaps remind us is, you know, Ron has been around long enough to see that kind of history of education, if you like, develop. What I mean by that is, Ron went to the grammar school here yeah. in Pontypri, and, you know, there was that division. You either went to the grammar school or you didn't. Mm -hmm. So very early on, children were sort of segregated. So if you were a late developer, tough. Um, Grammar school was the, and perhaps I shouldn't know, but you know, maybe some of these things come around again. Anyway, um, the kind of grammar school stream was developed and, and the secondary modern, yeah. but certainly. We were all working class kids. Yes. In the grammar well, school. That, that was where there was a kind of democracy because if you yeah. were working class, yeah. you could emerge. And you got free dinners. And you got free dinners. <laughs> but you could emerge, couldn't you? As you were. Right. Oh, yeah. you came oh, yeah. from that yeah. background. They give you the chance. And, of course, I was up to, up to the age of 18 in the grammar school. I was 18 in the August. In September, I was in the Air Force. National, what year are we now? National, that's 1947. 1951, you were 18. No, 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 1947. No, no, 40, 40, 47. Sorry, 1947, yes. I went into the Air Force yes. in 1947. 1947, just after the war. Yeah, yeah. Conscription, two years. So the grammar school system is still in place, 
yes. when you go into yeah. the RAF. Yeah. Yeah. And that's another thing perhaps to remind us all of, is that if you were male, not if you were female, but if you were male, you had to do national service, you had no choice. Yeah. You had to do national service, and that continued until 1960. So Ron's generation had to do national service. Um, so you did two years, two years. RAF, and you yeah. were a wireless, wireless operator, wireless mechanic. mechanic. Yeah. They give you trade tests to see your abilities, yeah. you know, and they want to check it using my hands and things. And, um, and then I, in I did no art at all. No. The, uh, one drawing I did of a mill, which was near where the station. One drawing in two years? Yeah, it's in the house, and it's a small mm -hmm. little thing. Um, but what was important about that really, I, I don't know if you people have this. Occasionally, you will get a revelation. And I mean a revelation. Something happens. Oh, that happened with photography as well. Okay. Yes, I right. forgot about that bit. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll say that first. I'll okay. Okay. I went, I used to go to Bath uh, quite regularly with my wife, and we used to go to the photographic headquarters in Bath. It's not there now. And there was an exhibition on there, and I was walking around, and I came to this photograph of rocks and mountains in the background, and it just took my breath away. I hadn't been doing photography properly then, I and it was a, an answer of Adams. Oh, wow, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. He it's is the absolute epitome mm. of landscape photographers. Mm. Um, and that was it. That was photography for me. But the other thing that happened in the Air Force, now, during my time in the grammar school, I hardly ever seen any modern art. I mean, this is, I mean, we, we didn't have sketchbooks. You could, I, well, I couldn't afford to buy a sketch. See, there was also rationing as well as... I used to draw. Practice. My father used to collect books, second yeah. hours. And in the front, there were always two empty pages, white pages, and that's where my drawing went on. So my father's books are all filled with drawings in the front. They've all gone now, unfortunately. But when I was in the Air Force, um, in those days, if you didn't come up to scratch, like the course you were on now, if at the end of the term you didn't come up to scratch, they popped you into the Air Force. Because some people got dispensation to go to college for some reason. Perhaps they knew somebody. I don't know. Um, anyway, I sat down to lunch one day and this lad sat beside me and he had this book of painting. And he started to open it. And they were all modern paintings. The Forbes and the uh, Cubists and so on. And he stopped at this one painting and it just took my breath away. It was Matisse Goldfish in the Bowl. Now I'd never seen or experienced anything like this in the form of a painting. Um, and that for me, I almost said to myself, God, that's what painting's all about. Mm -hmm. It's one of those, when you know, one of those moments. Yeah. Following this up quickly, years later, when my wife was alive, she's not with me unfortunately anymore, uh, we went to Russia. And we were walking around the Hermitage, Hermitage Museum. And I walked around the corner, and there was this big painting. And I thought, Jesus, it was the painting of Matisse Goldfish, which I'd never seen. I'd only seen a reproduction. And my wife comes around the corner and says, that's the bloody thing that started it all off. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I mean, you said that your, your wife isn't with you anymore. I mean, yeah. what I need to tell everyone is, of course, that's because she died yeah. 20, over 20 years ago. 22 years ago. Now. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, but, but, um, you know, there's that phrase, I don't know, you've probably all heard it, ars longa vita brevis. You know, art is long, life is short. Yeah, it's um, true. It's true. It sums it up, doesn't it, really? Yeah. It's an old phrase. Uh, but she was my anchor. Yes. Wouldn't let me get away with it. No. Well, you need that. You need that. You need, <laughs> oh, yeah, that, you need it. Yeah, I do. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, got um, it. But I'm hovering still between Right, the other thing I got in Lister, I never went to art college. So I never had an art, art lesson in my life. I went to teacher's training college, where the emphasis is on teaching not on your own um, subject. You did your own subject, obviously, but the emphasis was on how do you teach, you know, which is a big difference. Yeah. Okay, so, as I said, we're hovering between the whole business of education, you as an art educator, and, and the photography side still. So yeah. let's stay with, when you were in London, yeah. you mentioned the comprehensive. So in the 50s, comprehensives were an attempt to democratise education, so yeah. there wasn't that distinction between grammar and secondary Prior school. to that, there was a 1944 Education Act, um, which divided into three areas. There was the grammar school, the secondary technical school, and the secondary modern school. Yes. And you were, you were 
diverted into one of these three areas depending on your abilities. The secondary technical was for the more practical kids who couldn't quite make it academically. And the secondary modern was whoever was left. Yeah. That's the situation. And then, of course, the... And then with comprehensives, the, the, oh, the, the, the aim was that if you were an early or late developer or a different yeah. type of student, yeah. you know, there was scope... Oh, you could cross over. Yeah, you could, you could move, they could move you between yeah. schools. I suppose that experiment continued. I mean, I went to a comprehensive school. Yeah. So I mean, but that, that's, anyway, that's but sort the, of to give you an idea of how the comprehensive, I, I must confess I'm not in favour of comprehensive schools, I must confess that. Because you, you taught that to school that before it was and after yeah, it was yeah, comprehensive, yeah, yeah. so you've seen both yeah, sides. Yeah. yeah. So what, uh, one, one, of the, one of the things that, for example, I would, I would, within my class, I would have remedial children and potential university students all within the same class. Now, how the hell do you teach across a range like that? It's called mixed ability teaching. Mm. It, yes. It, it eventually, they began to stream well, yeah. so according to ability. But that, that, that was the idea of comprehension. Everybody gets the same chance. But, but everybody is not capable of taking the same chance, unfortunately. So staying on that kind of theme of education and perhaps the, the orthodox and the unorthodox, how did tell, I us, teach? tell us, <laughs> tell us, tell talk before that. Perhaps, tell us a little bit about you meeting Ivor Cutler and who he was. Yeah. Has London. anybody ever met or heard of Ivor? Good. <laughs> well, you can Google him, Ivor Cutler. Oh, significant. He figure. was. A, there was a program recently on the Great British Eccentrics, and he was one of them. Yeah. Uh, I met him in the yard of the school. He was teaching in a junior school, and I was in this comprehensive setup. And I looked across and there was this uh, teacher sitting on the windowsill, swinging his legs, and a pile of kids around it, fascinated by the stories he was telling them. So I went in and I listened, and we became firm friends. Um, and he was, a, he was a, a teacher who taught, I don't know if you've ever heard of this place, a school called Summerhill. There's a book called That Dreadful School. And it was a school run by A.S. Neal, who was a psychiatrist. And within the school, uh, they took ranges from infants all the way up to A level. And uh, within the school, every child had an equal say as to how the school was run. They would have an assembly, and if there was a decision to be made, every child would have the same vote. It was that kind of school. The kids could go to lessons if they wanted to, but no one stayed away from any lesson longer than a fortnight. Um, it was mixed. Um, they had a big mud heap down the bottom of the field where you could go and roll in the mud if you felt like rolling in the mud. It so was that's that what we need at university. We need uh, well, to I'm, I'm right. Oh yeah, definitely. I'm on board. <laughs> I used it well. We used, he was a. For example, we we both had different coats in those days. And we used to go to Campbell College of Art in the evenings to do life drawing. So in we go, now I run and I, and I had never, never done any drawing at all. Uh, he was a brilliant musician, but not, anyway, we sat down and the model was there. And I started scribbling away and I just sat there looking at this model and uh, the lecturer comes up. Got a problem, Ivor? Yeah, he said, I, I don't quite know where to start. He said, I don't quite know where to start. Oh, right. Nettle Smith was the name of the lecturer. Well, what do you do, I mean, you pick a point, say, the top of the breastbone there, right? Put the dot down. And then you try and judge where the point of that shoulder is, the angle, the slope, and the distance. Put a point. Do the same with the other shoulder. Blah. Anyway, he went on all night like this, I went out, putting dots on his paper. So he ends up with a shooter, <laughs> letting dots all over his paper. So I thought, oh, I've done it, he said, I can draw, I've done it. So next week now we go in, <laughs> and this time he walks in with a set of geometry sets. Protractors, set squares, <laughs> rulers, you name it. And there he was now measuring the angles so he could get it dead accurate. Put his dot, put his dot. And again, he finished up with it. I can draw, he said, I can draw. And that's how he learned to draw. <laughs> that made me think of people like you and you go and Coldstream, you know, who had this method. Oh, yes, that's right. Yeah, they did, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 very much so. Yeah. What was the story you were going to tell us about um, you and Ivor Cutler in the Tate Gallery? Oh, yes. Uh, he was very, 
definite about the painters he liked and the painters he didn't like. And one painter he certainly didn't like was, what is his name now? <laughs> uh, uh, oh God, you know, he did the crucifixion thing. Um, do you mean Selvo Dali? No, 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 no. Okay. You know, on the way I'm going. Francis Bacon. Francis Bacon. And there were the, the three crucifixion things. Ronnie said, I'm going to take out my penis and I'm going to pee all over those. <laughs> I said, for Christ's sake, I bet I'm out. <laughs> I'm gone. <laughs> he didn't. I persuaded him not to. But that's, that's the sort of chap he was. And we, for example, we have these um, duffel coats and we'd be coming out of the uh, college and we'd get onto a bus and we'd all, he'd always insist on going right down the front of the bus. And then we'd have a balloon each and we'd stick them under the hood. <laughs> So from behind, all you could see was this huge head, huge head yeah. <laughs> like a couple of people from Mars. And, yeah, so oh, he was a, yeah. and he turned he turned my life around, as you can you can see. He he made me think in a totally radical way. Um, took me one night out to a party, and I was talking to these dear old ladies, and I found afterwards they were Stanley Spencer's sisters. This sort of thing happened yes, quite yeah. casually, you know, yeah. and uh, it turned my life around. I was only there. Uh, in London for a year, but we kept in touch for many years. Yeah. yeah. He used to go around with a little harmonium. He used to give recitals in Oxford and Cambridge, you know, the students. They loved him. He was a real cult figure. Um, I remember I gave him a piece of sculpture once, one of the cast aluminium ones, funny enough. And I don't know if you remember, you remember a chap called Liberace who played the piano. And he always came in with a candlestick, a candle or a light and put it on his piano. Well, I was on television on a children's program. He was going to come in and play one. He writes funny little songs. He's written poetry as well, which are worth a read. Uh, and of course, tucked under his arm was my piece of sculpture. So he takes it, puts it on the piano before. Yes. He's an amazing fella. He's dead now, good dad. Yeah. An amazing chap. But he, he was a major influence on my life. I mean, another artist, coming back to Wales, of it was a sort of similar period, a similar age group to uh, Michael Cutler, of course, was Leslie Moore. Oh, yeah. Now, Leslie Moore, you may know, was a significant painter in his own right. He, he sort of essentially was the key figure in running Barry's summer school, yeah, which was yeah. very avant-garde for, for performance art and for painting and yeah. for fashion and for jazz and photography. I mean, everything. Yeah. was in music, yeah. the, the whole lot. Um, but he was also an arts advisor to South Wales. Yeah, Wales. South Wales. No, for where? Uh, South, Wales. South Wales. South Wales. South Wales. Yeah, arts, arts and you, you exhibited with him in Cardiff yeah. in the 60s. So yeah. yeah. You, is there anything you want to say about um, Leslie Moore as the art advisor and how he knew you as an art teacher, but also you, you, you know, the two of Well, his work was phenomenal. He, um, he had a very fluid style. Um, I, don't know, I don't know how he found the time to do it. He was so busy with, yeah. his, with his work. But he used to love to come to my workshop because this is going back to the early days now, and it was purely a, just a craft workshop. Mine wasn't just a craft workshop, that's what no, it was it designated. Wasn't, it wouldn't be. But I was <laughs> doing sculpt, getting kids to carve tree trunks and making masks and oh god, all sorts of things were going on. He used to love to come there because yeah. he never saw anything like that in any of the other schools, you see. Yeah. Um, and eventually we exhibited it quite a few times together, uh, me doing sculpture. I can obviously remember one piece I did, three boxes. I think it was a photograph in that. In yeah. So you did the yeah. sculpture. Yeah, and, and he did painting. Yeah. Um, in the Albany Gallery, was it? In the Albany Gallery and a gallery out in Cumbrian as well. Right. Something House or something like that. Um, yeah. Not Plantan and Grange. Plantan and Grange. There as well. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah he was a good guy. So you knew him in the two kind of capacities, him as an art educator. Yeah. Yeah. Each other's art and he gave me a tremendous amount of encouragement, you know, as well. Yeah. That's from the time I exhibited in the Royal Academy about that time as well, the first one. He encouraged you. Yeah, in 1958. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so you know, so Ron's exhibited widely, you know, throughout England and Wales. Mm -hmm. um, maybe to finish, Ron, because um, I know you want to speak to the students and see their work, maybe you could talk to us a little bit about this piece here, this sculpture. Um, it's got two sides to it, literally, isn't it? Uh, it's an egg on this side, in the middle, and it's a rugby ball on the other side. And it is interactive, in this sense, you know, in the sense it invites you. Obviously, interactive is the wrong word, but it's... And there's a keyhole at the back, you can peep through. And there's a keyhole. And surprise someone yeah. if they're looking through the other way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, it's called memories. Tell um, us, yeah. 
Well, my, my, in my grandmother's house, in the front room, uh, was this big table with legs and a chenille tablecloth. And right in the middle of this was a big Bible. And I would go in, because I only lived about two doors away from them, I would go in and my grandfather knew what I wanted, but he would not say to me, go in the front room, Ron. He'd wait until I would ask him, can I go? Because in this Bible were the most amazing coloured pictures of biblical scenes with tissue paper over each one, you know, the sort of thing. Um, so I spent many happy hours in there. I think that was my first connection with, with printed images because most of the images I saw as a child were black and white. There were no colour photographs or, or pictures in books or anything like that, it's just black and white. Um, anyway, that's, that's the, the bottom part. Then we come up to the sort of circle bit, which have, um, I collect old postcards. There's like Felix the Cat on there, was a 1930s image. Um, so and I turn, turned them into negatives because my big influence as a child, of course, was the black and white cinema. No colour, just black and white. So that was a big influence. And that, that incident is why I do so much black and white photography. It's still there. Mm -hmm. And then we come to, on top of it are the wildflowers and the butterflies that my father used to point out to me as we used to go walking on the mountains. Um, and then, of course, the, the eggs, which I used to love to look at. Never took any. But he would, he would find a nest for me to look into to see these beautiful eggs. And I think maybe that's where some of the sculptural ideas or feelings came from, these lovely forms on these, these eggs. Uh, and then we lead on to the bit which uh, Kerry just showed you where you can lift up. And in there, it's sort of my grandfather's pipe, uh, there's a television, there's all sorts of bits and pieces in there which relate to. And of course, um, the bird in the tree, and the cat always chasing the bird in the tree in my garden. Always climbing up and trying to catch the birds, and there we are. And then on the sunny days at the top. But again, the surrealism is coming through. Oh, yeah, there's a certain amount, yeah, yeah. I think it underlies pretty well everything. Shall I turn it round so people can see the other side? Do what? I can do that. There's not much difference. <laughs> well, except that you've got. And of course, rugby was a big part well, of my. Now you've got the cat's bottom. Yeah. <laughs> and if the. The eggs become the rugby. Oh yeah, well, that was very important. Because you played rugby oh, when you were... Uh, got my colours in the grammar school. Yeah. Uh, played for Signals Command in the Air Force. Um, played a lot of rugby at a very high level. And St. Luke's College, of course, which was a top college country uh, in rugby. So, yeah, rugby was important. But I realised then that I could damage my hands. So I gave up. Yes. And that was the reason. Because my hands were so important to me. That I, I gave up. Uh, the physical aspect of rugby. And the wildflowers you described are actually on the top yeah, surface here. Yeah, yeah. And we were there forever collecting herbs as we were out walking and bringing them back and making yeah. all these drinks that we were, oh God. So, <laughs> it's, <laughs> so it's your, your maternal grandfather really that was a maker. You said he made musical instruments. Oh yeah, well he played, uh, yeah. Uh, used to mend. People would bring a bird with a broken leg in and he would then put a slit on the leg and feed the bird and broken wings yeah. and all these things. He made ointments. Um, yeah. But maybe that's why you ended up making guitars as well, which are in the back of the gallery. It's possible, possible. But they all, it's strange because he played, my grandfather played a flute, mandolin, organ, euphonium. Uh, my father played the mandolin, banjo. Uh, my mother played uh, mandolin, wow. and they would all sit together, playing in the in the room, um, and I can always remember it. Of course, there should be a shilling in the slot in those days for oh, yeah. electricity. electricity yes. And of course, when that went out, and they'd be there playing, click all the light in the dark, and they wouldn't stop playing. They'd still be playing in the dark, <laughs> but none of us played. No. I didn't take interest until very later on in life. Now playing. I produced some musicals when I was in school. I mean, jazz is the music you particularly oh, like. So, I mean, I, what strikes me, you've got improvisation in jazz, and surely improvisation yeah. in your yeah. work as an that's, artist. That's what, that's, what that track, link? that's what attracts me. Yeah. And I was reading recently a book on jazz improvisation, um, and one of the things that struck me, and it's quite relevant really, uh, he's saying that practice makes perfect. 
but it also makes permanent. So if you want to be an improviser, don't get permanent. Practice in yeah. such a way yeah. that it isn't permanent. Mm -hmm. Still practice, but not, not this. But that's why many classical musicians, not all, but a lot of classical musicians, if you take the, the music away, they can't play. No, no, exactly. It's a different kind of mindset. Different kind of exactly. mindset. Whereas a jazz musician, once he's got the basic melody and the basic chord structure, then he's away. And that's yeah. what interests me. I don't play solo stuff. I play solo on the flute, but I don't, don't play solo on the guitar. I, I do rhythm on the guitar because I'm fascinated by jazz chord structures. Um, it's difficult to explain what we do. Well, thank you, Ron. That's, that's been great. Um, I think, uh, is, are there any questions? Can we just, just try one little experiment? Right? Yeah, please. Make a noise. <laughs> make a noise. <laughs> make a noise. <laughs> right, now get a piece of paper and make the shape of that noise. Now what I used to do with my students, they used to each have a piece of plasticine and I would carry out the same because when a teacher goes into the room, these were 11 year olds when they first came up from junior school, because the teacher says don't make a noise, I, first thing I'd say is make a noise. And they make a noise, and you know, they all clever at making noises. Right, now make the shape of the noise in the plasticine. Ooh, so, because they never knew what I wanted. I didn't want anything, I just wanted them. And then I'd say, right, now make two noises, which are different. And make two noises, and so on. Make three noises. And, and what I was doing was getting them to formulate a language, a personal language, which I would accept. Whatever they did, I would accept. They were formulating a language, communicating to me. It's a thing called synesthesia. It's the transference of one sense into another. Like one of the things I used to say to them, draw the shape of last week. <laughs> now it's to put people in a position where they don't know what you want them to do. Because mm. I don't think a teacher should be in that position. I see teaching, I, you can't teach it, people anything, I don't think. But what you can be is a catalyst to set the fire going, get, set the chemical reaction going. And that's what my, my whole teaching was based on. Giving them confidence and getting them. That's it then, I'll shut up now. No, that's, that's a great way to finish. Thank you, Ron. Uh, were there any questions before we have a little tea break? And then a studio visit? No, I was just thinking that's <laughs> 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 yeah. But see how, yeah. that, see how good yeah. that was? Yeah, we look at how distinctive and how did that. Yeah. You see? So it, it's, a, it's a language that you're formulating that you, no one has told you about. Or yeah. not, that you weren't capable of doing, and you are. I mean, there are lots of things we didn't look at. I mean, you know, we talk about the portal gallery. I mean, that little Adam and Eve there. There's, oh, that there's, was one of the portal That's one of the portal yeah. gallery ones. Yeah. You've got sort of a pen and ink that became the big... Adam and Eve out in the main gallery. So that sort of set late 70s, early 80s. I was saying how Ron mixed and made his own paints in the 50s, which was, you know, when really art and exhibiting art in Wales was only in its infancy just after the war, rationing was still in. Um, we saw the Zion Street out in the main gallery. By where I'm pointing now, by the door, you've got the, the girl and the boy that they're of that period as well. Um, I can't remember which one of you, hold on, oh well, you know your doll, I mean the one on the left is called Girl with Doll, and it is, I think Ron's picture is slightly creepy, your doll is, um, I mean look at the shape of the boy's face, how he, his head is almost like, um, like a, a, one of the rocks in the wall, anyways that's 50s paintings, um, I mean Ron talked about conventional photography in these, um, he's going into um, these are digital prints as well, and they are actually, they're not, the colour isn't manipulated, there's minimal colour in there. And at reception, opposite reception, there's a beautiful set of um, digital prints that you're mimicking what style? 
what was the meat um, by not, not, not government by chromate, it was a different approach. Selenium. Oh, uh, selenium printing. Yeah, yeah. The, the selenium printing. These were selenium printed, the black and whites there. The, it's a process where, in ordinary photography, you produce a print. And if you immerse it in a selenium uh, mixture, it, what it does, it replaces the silver content with selenium. And selenium is more permanent, because in time the silver content will darken. And not only that, but it adds a certain um, quality to the print as well. But you can't do it with digital. And one of my biggest problem was, how the hell do I produce digital prints with that quality? And people said it can't be done, but I think... You I did, did it, it's in reception. <laughs> and to the left of it is the embroidery that you were asking about, Laura, as well. Um, so, you know, there's, there are a lot of That's things... That's Blodaev from the Mabin Yeah, yeah. I mean, so much we've left out, really, but... Yeah, well, there we are, we've had enough now. You know, that is enough, exactly.